In the 50s and 60s, there was an emerging treatment for seizures where they severed the corpus callosum of severe epilepsy sufferers to minimise their effects. The corpus callosum is the only line of communication between the left and right hemispheres of the brain. They did this to counter the electrical signals firing off around the brain that causes the seizures. The plan was to stop these signals reaching both sides of the brain by snubbing them out when it reached the connection between the two sides of the brain. While we no longer do this, it did seem to work. You'd think that these people would act like they'd been lobotomised and not function normally, but surprisingly they were able to go back to their normal lives. This was of great interest to Sperry, who had already been disconnecting the sides of animals' minds for a while and couldn't wait to study the patients of this procedure. In 1968, he released his findings from these studies. As a bit of background before going forward, the right side of your brain is typically responsible for visual tasks, but is more associated with the control of the left side of your body. The left side of your brain is responsible for language production and again controls the right side of your body. Finally, before hearing the results, remember that all the participants were right-handed, so they were going to be better at tasks involving their left brain. He tested these people in three main experiments. The first was the describe what you see test. The patients were asked to stare at the middle of a screen as the images flashed up to the left and right side of their visual field. They were then asked to describe what they had seen. While I'm sure you wouldn't have struggled describing what you just saw on both sides, the people in the study were able to tell Sperry what they saw on their right visual field, but they were unable to describe what they saw on their left visual field, many not even realising they'd been shown anything at all. This was because their right brain had seen the image, but it couldn't produce the language needed to describe it, while the left brain had no problem doing so. Next was the tactile tests. First, objects were placed in the participant's right hand, then a different object was placed in their left hand. They were then asked to describe each object as well as find an object with a similar shape on the table in front of them without looking at them. When the object was placed in their right hand, they had no problem describing the object, as well as finding similar objects on the table. But when the object was in their left hand and they were asked to describe it, they could only come up with wild guesses, as while they knew that there was an object in their hand, their right brain wasn't able to tell their left brain what it was, so they couldn't describe it verbally. However, they were still able to find objects that felt similar on the table, but if they were asked why they were similar, they couldn't verbalise why they chose that object. The final tests were the drawing tasks. Similar to the first task, the participants were asked to look at the screen as an image is presented to their left and right visual fields, but this time they were asked to draw the image with the hand on the same side. The images shown on the right came out a bit wonky from the right hand, but it was kind of recognisable because the left brain isn't great at drawing, but it can do a bit, which is why the result wasn't unrecognisable whereas when the image was shown on their left visual field, the drawings were consistently clearer despite all of them being right-handed, and as we learnt from the first experiment, opposite sides would not have been able to draw anything, as the two sides can't communicate. As well as showing that these people had two independent brains that worked independently, the result also solidified the idea that the left brain is dominant in terms of speech and language, while the right brain is dominant in terms of visual motor tasks. You may have heard that left-handed people are typically more creative, as they can visualise better due to their dominant right visual motor skills brain. But being able to draw better doesn't automatically make you better at solving problems, that shouldn't make sense. Well as we now know, the left brain creates our language, so for these left-handed people the words are still made in their left brain, but they then have to travel to their right dominant side and then down to their left hand to write. Over their development into adulthood, the connections between their two minds become stronger and stronger. The same goes for many people who have pursued creative activities during childhood while being right-handed. For example, drawing ideas come from the right, travel to the left and then back to the right hand. These people are going to be typically more predisposed to having a creative mindset, but like many aspects of the body, it becomes stronger the more you do something. These people's minds throughout growing up have been practicing sending signals between their two minds constantly, while the rest of us haven't needed to do so, as we can get by in our chosen activities without the need of too much communication. So these two groups don't just get their creativity from having a dominant right brain, but as they've been forced to make these connections throughout their lifestyle. So these two groups don't get their creativity from having a dominant right brain, 
but as they've been forced to make these connections through their lifestyle, it makes them better at achieving ideas from past experiences as there are many more shortcuts around their brain compared to the rest of us whose connections are longer or unreachable through weaker links. People who have these types of minds, not that it's a binary measure, will be quite chuffed to hear what I've just said. While those who are typically more logically minded may feel a bit bitter about hearing the ways that these people are better than them. This however is not necessarily the case, as it really is a double-edged sword. If a brain can make these strong connections through positive creative aspects, it is however going to be making these connections through more negative times in their life too. If a logical mind is like a computer circuit board where each input, positive or negative, travels through a circuit and is processed and filed away nice and tidy, a more connected mind is like having a cup of water splashed across it and the signals start jumping across and start to interfere with other processes and wreaks havoc with the whole system of processing information. Anyone who's come into contact with a large amount of art students for example will know they seem to be riddled with anxiety disorders for this same reason. But while no one's brain actually works like a computer, it is a nice easy way to explain. A logical mind may see three separate problems in their life. Being late for work, which can be solved by skipping breakfast and driving a bit faster. Not getting on with a co-worker, which can be solved by avoiding the co-worker until a better time. And struggling to meet a profits target, which can be solved by looking at different ways to push profits. This logically makes sense as there's three problems and three solutions, but it isn't that simple for these more connected minds, as it looks more like this. Being late for work means that my co-worker that I don't like will tell on me, which makes me look even worse considering I'm already behind on profits compared to my co-worker, but it's because I can't seem to get there on time because I slept in after thinking about profits all night, especially after what my co-worker said yesterday about her profits. Meanwhile, I can't even seem to arrive on work on time. I'm just a terrible person. How do you solve being a terrible person? Well, you can't really because it's three external problems that have now been internalized in yourself. A connected mind can be a messy one, but don't get me wrong, both types of minds will still go through stressful times. This is just one way that creative types can be more susceptible to anxiety. In reality, you won't find anyone who is fully creative or fully logical. We're not machines, we are biology, and we all carry aspects of both types. Luckily, or not so luckily for some, because we are biology, we are able to change in accordance with our environment. So there are methods to attempt to change our thought processes. These are by no means a cure to any problems, but more of a way of working with the cards you've been dealt. For those who would like to disconnect their thoughts from each other, one of the top exercises is to live in day-tight compartments. This was promoted by the author Dale Carnegie, whose most popular book is currently the 14th most pirated book on the Pirate Bay which is interesting considering it was written in 1936. But it was in his other book, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living, where he explained the idea of focusing on what needs doing today. We'll go back to the work stress problem for a more practical example. Being late for work is an easy one as it is a single day problem. Today you can skip breakfast and drive a bit faster, but safely. What about the co-worker? Well, this isn't a one day problem. She said that awful thing last week and she got the promotion when you should have got it. But what is today's problem? Well, you might have your lunch break time line up with hers. Other than that, you probably won't see her. If you forget all the irritating things she did last week and stop predicting all the terrible things she may do next week, it really just boils down to being civil for half an hour or so, which doesn't sound so hard when it's not connected to the web of frustration that surrounds her. Finally, you need to earn profit. You can't just ignore the future because each day is a day working towards the larger goal but the rest of the year sounds like a mammoth task. What about trying to focus on just making one more sale today? This still has a positive effect on tomorrow, but focuses only on the now and what you can do today. After all, you can only affect today. Essentially, try and recognize each individual problem and notice when things have started to get connected. Almost all things are ultimately connected, but you will not be able to fix everything, but you can fix each thing. It's important to take the time to really separate these thoughts. What about those who want to connect their mind together more, seeing as even those overthinkers can benefit from making these connections in a healthy way? Dr. Karashima famously said, if you don't use your brain, it will age quickly. It's like not using your body. You'll get out of shape and weak. Granted, he's just a floating head, but he is still a doctor. When you are learning, trying new things, or just improving on something you already know how to do, blood flow spreads around the whole brain, strengthening the mind. So the more you learn, the easier it is to learn. When you're able to move this information around your brain, you can retrieve information too. 
this is where the creativity comes in. To give a real example, here's a scan of a brain in thought, and a second one is similar to you watching videos like you are now. Sorry for using another reference from brain training on the DS, but here is a scan of the brain doing maths problems and reading aloud. Typically, doing something harder will have better results, however it can be hard to stick to something more difficult, so choosing something that works for you is always best. For this, I'll just use the example from Dr. Kawashima of reading aloud. Here, you're reading a science book, reading the words connecting to your internal dictionary, where you'll find a new word, but it's similar to one you already know, so you'll find it easier to remember. You add the new knowledge with its context to your existing web on the topic. Meanwhile, you are multitasking by reading aloud, getting information on the correct pronunciations of the words, and doing this takes a fair amount of focus and concentration. This is a very basic model of what's going on, but you get the idea. This being said, if it's late wherever you are, I would recommend that you start tomorrow and go to sleep, as sleep considerably strengthens these bonds and is integral to the effective mind filing system where it removes the traumatic emotions from objective truths. But it's a bigger topic for another time, considering 51% of people worldwide report getting less sleep than they feel they need to on an average night. Please consider subscribing for more related content yet to be released at the time of making this video. The next video may be out within a few weeks, depending if I'm furloughed from work for another month. If not, it may be a longer wait. The topics discussed in this video may only be applicable to those of healthy sound mind. Please put any criticisms in the comments, and I recommend anyone watching please do look at these.